Good evening. My name is Natalia Sabchuk, and on behalf of Infeminis Veritas and the Junge de GA, I would like to welcome you to tonight's discussion. Solidarity on the border, the role of civilian activists in a poland belarus migrant crisis. In Feminis Veritas is a student organization that aims to showcase Eastern European female artists, activists, and scholars highlighting the current cultural and political issues in the region through a feministic lens. We are so excited to be partnering with Berlin Brandenburg chapter of the Junge DGO, the German Association for Eastern European Studies, the largest network for research on Eastern European, on Eastern Europe uh, within German speaking countries. Um, we have a great group of speakers for you tonight. Uh, before we will begin, I would like to address a few admi administrative points. Um, this is a recorded event. Uh, the panel discussion will take about an hour and then we will open up for questions and discussion with our audience. You can ask questions via the Q&A tool or by raising your virtual hand. Both of those T tools are on the bottom of your Zoom window. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Nadia. Nadia Ziefert is a member of Junge de GO and our moderator for the evening. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Welcome everyone also from my side. Um, I would like to introduce to you our panelists for today, which are um, Katarzyna Staszewska, she is an activist from Grupa Granica, which is a group of aid organizations and activists helping um, the ref um, helping refugees in Poland um, at the Polish border. Then you have with us um, Kiri Kofanov. He is a lawyer and activist from Human Constanta. This is a human rights organization dealing with the topic of refugees in Belarus already for five years. And uh, our next guest is Dr. Lydia Cecin Jurek. She's a research fellow at the ERC project Unlikely Refuge Refugees and Citizens in East Central Europe in the 20th Century, carried out at the Czech Academy of Sciences. She holds a PhD in history and civilization and has been researching and lecturing um, at the Europa Universität Viadrina here um, in Frankfurt Oder. So welcome everyone also from my side and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us, our panelists, also at such a short notice. Um, today we are focusing on two countries. Um, the first one is Belarus, where hundreds of thousands of protesters took it to the streets around the falsified presidential elections in 2020 when Lukashenko stayed in power. As a reaction, EU Sanctions were implemented and what followed to the mass demonstrations were repressions and political imprisonments. Recently, also civil society organizations have been a major target of these repressions. We will also talk about the Pol Poland or the Polish side of the border, where the national conservative government has been changing the justice system rapidly since its first election in 2015. These judicial reforms, as well as other changes of democratic institutions, have met an erosion of Polish democracy. The Polish uh, society has been showing its deep divisions on several topics in the last years, such as women's rights, history, and the role of the church, but also in the question of migration, what we will talk about today. Poland as a EU, EU member state has also been part of the rather absent European, European migration policies. But our focus today um, are neither national nor EU foreign policies, but the role of civil society and NGOs and the current situation on the ground at the border. So let us turn to the situation at the border. And uh, please, Lydia, I would um, ask you at first to give us an overview. So what has happened since the summer when the crisis became visible? 
thank you. Thank you for um, your invitation and for having this panel and, and, and for the question. Uh, first of all, two disclaimers. As you said, I am a historian and therefore uh, it is not uh, easy for me or maybe not entirely my place to carry out um, analytical periodization of events that are happening nowadays. But I can definitely draw on my historical expertise and see some uh, recurrent motives and mechanisms uh, in this situation. So I very much uh, appreciate the composition of this panel, um, my co-panelists, uh, who will be able to bring maybe more contemporary insight. And I'm uh, also very much um, looking forward to hearing from them. And the second point uh, is that I realize that the nature of, of the matters that we are going to talk about today is delicate. And um, the scientific commentary may sound sometimes a bit cold or distant. And I hope you bear with me in this sense. Uh, and now about uh, your question about the situation and chronology. So the sequence of uh, events which has led to the fact that we are talking today in our virtual space about people who find themselves entrapped in a paradoxically open space because we say they're in the open air, right? Uh, and yet they cannot leave it because they are subject to being pushed back by the border guards of two countries. So the sequence of events is twisted and, and uh, really uh, strange, but it can be told very quickly. So I, I um, would ask maybe other panelists to elaborate on, on aspects I possibly neglect or fail to mention. Let me just shortly uh, sketch out the situation from the Polish uh, side of the border and the legal, if this word applies, measures that were put into force. The situation began, as you said, um, in, in the summer when the Belarusian authorities set up uh, channels to smuggle migrants out of the country across the EU border into Lithuania, Latvia and Poland. The procedure started, in fact, in Lithuania somewhere in June and then uh, it came to Poland in, um, in August, the beginning of August. Uh, Polish border guards began to block and send migrants back to Belarusian side, especially near the village of Usnasz Górne, which became the first uh, symbol of these events. And on the 31st of August, the Polish government adopted a resolution imposing a state of emergency along the border strip. It was accepted by the president um, the next day, uh, covering almost 200 towns in Podlaski and Lubelski Voivod ships. So one should mention um, that also the Latvian and Lithuanian governments uh, introduced those measures. Uh, one month later, um, uh, po Polish parliament decided to extend the state of emergency for further 60 days. And according to the constitution, it could not be extended again. Uh, but two months later, um, on December 1st, the president extended it indefinitely, uh, signing the so-called Border Protection Act, uh, which seems to be, according to the legal scholars, a circumvention of the constitution. So uh, not only the media, but also aid groups, humanitarian organizations, activists, medics, and lawyers are not allowed into the zone throughout all this time. And in addition to that, uh, in mid-October, the parliament uh, and the president passed the so-called pushback law, which amends uh, the act of on foreigners and the act of uh, on granting protection to foreigners. And, and as the name suggests, uh, suggests it also it allows for pushbacks and leaving applications for international protection unprocessed. So these provisions violate the principles of the EU asylum law and the Geneva Convention, and as argued by experts from the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. And uh, one more thing uh, about this regulation is it, that it was issued ex post uh, to legitimize, in fact, something that has been going on for a long time. And maybe just to finish the, the chronology itself, um, what has to be mentioned, uh, let me just uh, say that um, since uh, mid-September, the Polish border guards um, started to find corpses of uh, migrants on the border, and this is very important to, to the chronology. But as you, as you can realize, we, we are dealing here with a, a very complex uh, situation, a multi-threaded pro problem, because the plight of refugees is built um, on a series of paradoxes of the current uh, political situation, border regime, 
and, and we have here a humanitarian crisis and people suffering and dying on the border. But this problem uh, is caused by um, the bilateral Belarusian-Polish political conflict, which these people got caught up in. But also, of course, this is conflict um, of the broader scope between Belarus, we could also say the Russian Federation, and, um, and the EU. Uh, and we have also, of course, here the problem of the evolution of the European Union's approach um, to refugee arrivals in general, and this is um, a huge topic. There is the question of Frontex, which is situated, the seat of which is situated so close to this border, so in Warsaw, and but it, uh, its help is not being um, allowed there. Um, but uh, I think that um, when we speak about chronology, the last thing I should probably mention is that the current situation is another facet of, of the general attempts of migrants to come to Europe that have been um, going on for over a dozen of years. So first, uh, from the beginning of, the, of our century through the uh, southern maritime border, which intensified around, as we know, 2015, then especially through the southeastern uh, part of it, the so-called Balkan route, and in 2018, the Turkish-Greek border, and now through the Belarusian uh, one, which takes place also as a result of evacuation of Americans from Afghanistan uh, and Lukashenko, Lukashenko's idea to use this opportunity to lure refugees to the eastern a border of the EU and use their presence for his political purposes. So this is the classic logic of coercive use of purposefully created migration and, and a refugee uh, crisis. We can read about it in Kelly Underhill's study, Weapons uh, of Mass Migration, for example. And uh, we would say that Lukashenko is here this typical metaphorical arsonist who uh, wishes to play a role of a firefighter right um, afterwards. Um, and then uh, I'm sure we will hear from our Belarusian colleague about um, Belarus Belarusian objectives related to pursuit of lifting sanctions and, and the question of imprisoned uh, oppositionists. Um, there are also goals of the Polish government. I could speak about them, but maybe there is no time for that uh, right now. But in this very whole complex picture, we have, of course, and I'm coming back um, to, the, to my first point, human suffering, refugees dying of cold, and, and people who help them, uh, the activists, uh, their position, their role in those actions, uh, the public perception of, of their actions. And this is, in fact, uh, what our today meeting is primarily about. Thank you. Yes, so thank you for this overview. And uh, right now, I would really like to put the focus on the current situation at the border and uh, I would give or uh, address my question to Kasia. You have been um, at the border um, since October, as you told me. And uh, I mean, we saw pictures of people directly at the border um, and very difficult conditions. And uh, we've been hearing of deaths reported, but we don't have so many ways or information that we get from there and that's really the point why I would like to start with this and ask you what is the current situation at the Polish border, Polish side of the border and what have you been observing there? Sure, thank you so much Nadia and thanks so very much for, for having me and also thanks to, thank you Lydia for uh, for really um, a great overview. Uh, just to say, as uh, as Grupa Granica, we have been on the on the border or in the border area uh, since August. So since the since the crisis has started with the group from Usnash, it was first group of thirty Afghanis that were kind of caught in in some in um, what we call a no man's land. No one was kind of you know, try, I mean, on, at least on the Polish side, the Polish government was saying they're in Belarus, Belarus, Belarus was saying they're in Poland. And, and basically since that time, we have been seeing the crisis escalating, um, um, uh, really hitting its hardest, hardest moment in mid-October until let's say mid-November. And now um, calming down um, a little bit as far as numbers of people trapped in the woods 
um, uh, is concerned, but by no means this crisis is over. So um, I'm sure by now uh, most of the people, if not everyone, have seen the pictures in, in, um, in the news of, of the groups of migrants, um, often families with small children, um, you know, covered with the NRC, this kind of silver, uh, uh, silver gold, gold uh, um, blankets um, um, uh, in the woods, um, um, uh, kind of caught between the rock and a hard place, being trying to seek refuge in Europe, but at the same time hiding from the from the Polish border border guards uh, being afraid of pushback um, uh, um, to Belarus and unfortunately this is still um, this is still the picture what has changed is that we are now in winter uh, so we have snow and um, uh, we already have minus 15 degrees um, uh, in the in the border um, um, in the Podlaskie Voivodeship uh, in the um, uh, in the border area so of course the conditions are are much much worse. Um, um, when you know when when I was at the border in October, I have been I have been meeting people in the woods who have been there for let's say one week, two weeks, sometimes three weeks, and they've been pushed back. Some of them three times, some of them ten times. These days, the meet, the, meet, the people we meet in the woods have often been there for weeks, or if if not for months, and the numbers of pushback. Uh, from the Polish border um, security guards to Belarus are intense. Um, uh, so uh, uh, what has indeed started as a as a as a, um, um, kind of um, a crisis um, uh, instrumentalized for political gains by the by the by the Lukashenko regime. Um, uh, uh, to for his own kind of political purposes, um, and uh, uh, what is a very very cruel instrumentalization of 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 people's strategies, people's tragic stories, as many of them are many people many people we meet in the woods are escaping worse. They are escaping violence, discrimination, persecution. Most of the people we meet in the forest are from Syria and they're from Iraq and they're from Kurdistan as well. There are also people from other places such as Yemen, such as Congo, um, uh, but most of the people are from, from, from Syria and Iraq uh, um, has actually, uh, uh, and, and they are crossing the border just to meet the, the cruelty and violence um, on the Polish uh, on the Polish side by the Polish border um, security guards uh, 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 to and to be um, to, and to be pushed back um, to Belarus. Just to give you a very rough number, uh, as Grupa Granica, um, we are trying to reach out to people in the woods with humanitarian assistance, with legal aid. We're trying to assist them to get medical medical help, and I will tell talk a little bit more about this in the next round in terms of how we do that. But just to give you a very rough estimate, since the beginning of the crisis um, uh, in August until the end of November, we have been um, asked uh, for help by at least uh, 5,500 people. And, um, uh, and I want to emphasize that we are an informal network of activists and NGOs, not professional humanitarian organizations whatsoever. We've never done crisis response before, and the local inhabitants of the border area. So um, this number um, is, is, is quite telling, 5,500. And from our analysis of data coming from the Polish border security guards, we've heard about since the beginning, the beginning of the crisis until mid-November about approximately 30,000 uh, 30, of trials to attempts to cross the border, irreg irregular border crossing. So people trying to cross the border from Belarus to Poland. Sometimes uh, the same people try to cross multiple times. So um, the 30,000 points out to this attempts, not the people out. And um, approx approximately 27,500 uh, pushbacks. So that can give you a little bit of an estimation what kind of scale um, uh, we're talking about. 
and even though um, the pictures from you know people trapped in the woods are out of the news headlines at the moment, uh, this does not mean that the uh, that the people are not there anymore because they are, and we receive calls for help every day. Um, and uh, a part of pushbacks, um, which means that they are, um, uh, if they wish to, even a part of pushback, which means that even when they want to apply for international protection, not everyone wants to, but even if they want to, um, they're often prevented from doing so. They are not registered and they're just being taken um, uh, to, to the border fence by the Polish border, uh, border security guards very often. Um, we also hear about the cases of family separation, um, uh, including the minors being lost in the woods, uh, including husbands being uh, lost, uh, I mean, the husbands losing their wives and brothers, sisters, and vice versa. And um, even, um, uh, even uh, when they are, I mean, and for those who are not um, uh, subjected to pushbacks and they manage to um, uh, submit their claim for international protection, most of them um, end up in detention uh, where the living conditions are extremely difficult um, and cruel. Uh, and uh, that's another kind of crisis that we, I think we, we, we will see kind of arising um, uh, as, as they are not really informed about, you know, what's the future for them, what's the status of the application, what's next, how long they're going to stay there. And very often people in a very, very vulnerable um, physical and mental um, health condition with children are in this detention. Um, and as Lydia said, uh, we, in terms of um, the numbers of deaths, we have at the moment approximately 20 um, deaths that they have that have been accounted to. But to put the exact number is very difficult because of the emergency area, because of the emergency state that has been prolonged. No humanitarian organizations, media, medics, or international observers have access. So it's very difficult to have a precise information how many, you know, how many deaths have, have there been. Uh, uh, but of course, we know that there are more than 20. Um, uh, and, uh, and just to say that what has been the most recent developments, a part of the fact that the winter has arrived and there's minus 15 also to survive in the woods, which is the biggest prim primeval wood in Europe, full of swamps and fallen trees is absolutely impossible um, uh, or rather very difficult, especially at any time, but especially when it's minus 15 degrees, is that we have also seen a strong kind of intimidation, criminalization campaign from the Polish government, from the Polish authorities to really send a very strong message that helping migrants is illegal, which is of course not true. What we do is absolutely illegal, but um, to kind of, to, to have this kind of rhetoric of fear and hate really taking root, which means a lot of very, very brutal stop and search operations, smearing campaigns against those of us who speak up publicly or in the media for the rights of migrants, which of course makes this whole thing difficult and increasingly dangerous for us and what we've also of legalization of really unlawful procedures according to international human rights standards are also kind of taking more and more root in the european discussions and the european commission and the european union um slowly coming up with proposals to amend existing standards um, um, uh, on migration and international protection uh, by kind of watering them down. And in this way, kind of a giving green light to countries like Poland um, to kind of continue doing what they're doing um, to protect, uh, so-called to protect the European borders uh, despite the humanitarian crisis and suffering that is going on there. Yes, thank you. So maybe before we look at uh, also, or we could discuss also European Union's perspective. Um, I mean, uh, now Kasia has already mentioned a lot of data, um, um, at least what she has received. Um, Lydia, is there, 
is there anything is there any other data you've been observing or do you feel this is the data we have so data of is that the data we have the data of polish border guards and of these organizations or how is the information situation in general how do we uh can we imagine this zone i mean a state of emergency zone that basically uh, activists and ngos and also journalists are not uh, allowed to answer uh, to uh, enter so uh, do you know any any more have you heard of any more information on the area and the data um, when it comes to the data, I'm sure that Kat uh, Katarzyna uh, is able to give more complete uh, answer to, to this question. But as far as <clears throat> the uh, question of data is concerned, from which our knowledge about the place of origin, for example, and the number of migrants is... Um, so, so from the very beginning, the rely, re, reliability of, of this data was a problem because uh, of the blockade, as uh, Kasia said, we rely mainly on the official statistics provided by the border guard and the wording they are using, the phrases they are using to communicate uh, statistics is, is undefined, is, is new to us. So, for example, they would speak about the cases were uh, of prevention of an illegal border crossing, but we don't know exactly what this term really means. Um, and uh, symptomatically, uh, the first concrete information uh, that uh, uh, we received uh, back in August came from the notes written down by the refugees themselves and from the words they uh, shouted to the interpreters, uh, volunteer uh, interpreters at the border. So now many weeks later, to get some idea of the situation, one can try to consult the statistics uh, of the detained persons um, and we can see where um, most migrants come from. And these figures should be treated only as indicative. They can be verified, for example, by the German data on the number and origin of migrants who have crossed uh, the border all the way from Belarus uh, to, um, via Poland uh, to Germany and now are uh, being uh, received uh, in Frankfurt under order and they normally would stay in Eisenhuttenstadt, which is not far away from where I'm sitting right now uh, in Frankfurt uh, under order. So uh, this is for, for, for the data. Hey, thank you. Um... I mean, maybe I would already like to turn um, to the Belarusian side, Kirill, if you're with us, and um, maybe also a similar question. I mean, which information, I know uh, that you've not been directly at the border, but maybe you could tell us which information reaches you. How is the situation um, at the Belarusian border? Uh, what what can you hear? Where where is your information from? What can you hear about the situation? Maybe you could, can at first give us a broad impression of what you and your organization has reached about the Belarusian side of this border. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, yes, really. So maybe the uh, the only the biggest problem of our like team and organization nowadays is that we have do not have the direct access to the border so because we are liquidated yes so the only one like source of information for us it's online communication with the refugees so and as far as we understand from their messages from their videos that they sent to us it first of all first thing the main thing is that the belarusian bodyguards uh, deliberately do not allow them refugees to officially contact the Polish border guards. Uh, and so it means that they do not allow them to uh, apply for international protection, yes? And uh, the second thing, uh, thing that um, uh, also I want to mention is that uh, people, um, it, this is the fact that people are forced to break the law to cross the border uh, with Poland and they violate the uh, consistent legal framework. But we should understand, yes, really that the, there is a lot of uh, armed force, uh, like border guards near. So it's very difficult to understand the motivation of people, whether they're afraid, whether uh, it was their own decision. Once again, we get no access to them and now no one interviewed them uh, from this perspective. And also the, another thing, for us, 
this is one of the most important thing is uh, that from these like, reports from the migrants, we understand uh, that the bodyguards prevented them uh, from, it was um, in the past, when it was a um, refugee camp on the border, uh, they told us that the body, the Lushan bodyguards uh, do not allow them to leave this camp and to go back to the cities. So it also, uh, once again, we could use it uh, like an evidence that uh, the Belarusian authorities use uh, these people, this category of people as a um, um, like shield uh, to make the pressure on the uh, European Union uh, officials on the like countries like uh, Lithuania, Poland, and uh, Latvia, and the fact that uh, like uh, on 11th of November, as far as I remember, they allow people to stay in the this logistical center. Yes, uh, starting to provide them humanitarian assistance, uh, medical assistance, and so on and so on. It leads us, so it shows us that it was like the decision making process from the Belarusian authorities. And when do they realize that it will help them, like from somehow from their perspective, from their motivation, they starting to provide the humanitarian system. Before there was even not like no stem, step from their point of view, from their perspective towards the refugees. Okay, so as we know, um, um, or as has been claimed, Lukashenko, it was a strategy to, of Lukashenko also to do this kind of, let's call it not advertisement, but in lack of a better word, uh, or um, spreading about this possibility of coming to Belarus. So, um, but my question would be, um, maybe, okay, again, back to what you've been saying. Um, I understand um, that you're in contact only um, online with the refugees. Um, um, you've been, um, or could you could you explain a little bit better um, what like what do do they face with border guards? Because the one thing is they're not you said they're um, they're they should not cross the border at the border points and they should not go back to Minsk, right? Could you be a bit more specific? How um, so? there's now a strategy that they stay at these camps uh, which are provided by the Belarusian state maybe to give a good impression also on state television. Um, can you elaborate more? Um, what have you been hearing? Um, are, are they mostly now in the region stuck or how is the situation now for them? So uh, from the main thing that we should understand it uh, it means that uh, so we have some connections uh, with the refugees direct, but at the cities, yes, uh, not at the border because we have got no access to the border, yes. But we should understand that both like um, on the refugee camp, as it was before, um, in the logistic center and in the cities, refugees is under the control of the government, of the official bodies. So. Uh, of the migra migration department officers. So it's very difficult to contact refugees in a um, hotel, in a hostels, uh, in a airports nowadays uh, when they uh, like authorities organize these flights uh, from the Belarus to the Iraq. Yes, it's very difficult because uh, so um, always near the uh, refugees, there was some, I don't know, police officer, armed bodyguards, armed soldiers, and so on and so on. So it's very difficult for the representative of, of NGO to contact with the refugees. So this is maybe the main thing and the main differences uh, with the, like, I don't know, previous uh, previous migration crisis that it was uh, before, like in 2007, in 2016, with the Russian Federation uh, refugees from the Russian Federation, mostly from Chechnya, yes, in Gushetia, Dagestan. So we should understand, yes, that um, yes, they like Belarusian authorities uh, help refugees with uh, visa visa support. Yes, these refugees came here to the Belarus, arrives illegally. Yes, but all the things uh, all 
all those transfers from the uh, Minsk to the uh, border, all the process of how do they stay in the refugee camp or in, a, once again, a logistic center or in the ho hostels, hotels, everything is under the control of the government. Okay, and then the last question directly to this. So in this circumstance where there are guided, let's say, um, without a break, and it's very dif difficult to even get in contact with those refugees. Um, can you even, as a human rights organization, do you have any means to, um, to find out about human rights violations? Can, do you have a possibility to observe anything? Um, or is that basically impossible? And only, only if the once again, only if uh, refugees share this information with us, telling us that they they was faced with this one, these things, these things. Yes, we just collect this information. But as far once again as we got no access, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for us uh, to like collect some I don't know evidences to. Uh, well, and even to speak, speak with the uh, refugees directly. So if they contact us online or we get some uh, just contact with them online, even if they cross uh, already crossing the border between the Belarus and Poland, they some, somehow agree to share this information. Maybe they you know, film something or uh, has some I don't know, documents or stamps and so on and so on. So they agree to like show us this thing. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we will turn back to the Polish side and uh, Kasia, um, now when we look at NGOs and activists, I mean, uh, not it's not the same situation as in Belarus, but it's also an extremely difficult one. And that's why I would like to ask you, what are Grupa Granica's activities at the border? Um, how can you work? in this um, emergency zone? What does it practically mean? How do you cooperate? And also maybe if you could mention how is the cooperation with locals also? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nadia. And also thanks, Kirill, for, for sharing um, um, the, the side perspective from the Belarus. It's, it's really, very rarely that we have an opportunity to hear that. So again, my appreciation for you for being here. I know it's uh, it's not so easy um, and uh, to speak about these issues in the current context. And Nadia, you said the situation is different on the Polish side, for sure it is, but I think that something that we share and is the key word in the context of this crisis is no access. Uh, there is no access and it's extremely dangerous and unfair, of course, towards the people that really need humanitarian assistance as that whose lives are in danger as they are trapped in this uh, uh, and as they are trapped in the woods and between the Polish and Belarusian border uh, in this political kind of dispute. Um, uh, because uh, as Lydia has said in the beginning, Polish government has introduced a so-called a state of emergency, which has been de facto prolonged um, uh, um, uh, on the 2nd of December until the beginning of March, which means that we have no access to the four kilometer stretch alongside the border um, uh, as humanitarian organizations, activists, media, uh, international observers. Um, and this is where, of course, the biggest number of people are. This is, of course, you know, where also the biggest need for assistance is. Uh, so as Grupa Granita, um, which I again emphasize is an informal network of 14 organizations um, uh, uh, that have never done humanitarian crisis response before. We are not professionals. Um, the NGOs that are making up Grupa Granica are the NGOs that have been doing education, integration, um, speaking for the rights of migrants and refugees but never done a humanitarian crisis response. Um, uh, and the network of locals and the network of independent activists, we have organized ourselves to uh, kind of feel 
the, the gap um, uh, that is there as there are, no, there are no state services, there are no professional humanitarian organizations on the ground to really reach out people trapped in these wolves with humanitarian assistance. So we bring them food, we bring them water, we bring them warm clothes, and just basically the, the key things you, you need to survive. We also support people trapped in the woods with legal aid. That means that we have uh, um, a group of lawyers um, uh, uh, with us that are um, uh, um, kind of trying to work with this overstretched system um, to do whatever possible to guarantee the right to international protection, um, uh, which often means kind of uh, sending applications for um, uh, special measures through the European Human Rights Tribunal to make sure that the people are not going to, the migrants are not going to be pulled back to Belarus. And we also assist the people uh, in the woods to um, get medical help uh, which means that we either have in some of our groups the medics with us, or we kind of collaborate with the, with the group um, uh, of medics. Um, 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 they are, um, this, this is the, the wonderful group of medics that started as Medics on the Border, a volunteer initiative as well, um, uh, um, that has been now kind of from mid-November kind of operated by um, Polish Center for International Aid, which is the only kind of that is operating get, get, with getting direct services to people trapped in the woods. But what I want to emphasize is that we're only able to reach out to people that go out, that, are man that, that manage to cross out from this um, emergency area, like no-go area. So this is only when we can go. This is as far as we can go. We cannot officially go um, to this no-go area. Sorry for kind of uh, um, that, that's that, that's kind of Polish English English language. What I'm trying to say that this no emergency state area is a place we we can't enter, and there the biggest burden or the biggest share of responsibility lies on local population. Uh, local people who I really want to emphasize responded tremendously. Uh, they have pulled their lives, their economies um, on hold to really um, get to the woods uh, to save lives. Um, uh, and they are the only ones who can do this uh, in this uh, in this area covered by the emergency state. And as you can imagine, there are different attitudes especially with this kind of within the context of the of this kind of fear and criminalization campaign run by the Polish government that it's you know it's like that migrants are our enemies and that, and that you know helping is illegal which is I want to emphasize is not true um, it's absolutely legal according to the Polish law and constitution too to help people trapped in the woods, even though we are believed that it's not. Uh, but these are the local people that really have an access to those that are trapped closest to the border. So, so we, it, it's amazing. I mean, on one hand, what has happened is absolutely amazing because in response to this humanitarian uh, crisis, the movement has been built. Uh, a movement of independent activists, local people, NGOs that really cannot uh, cannot just stay silent and are kind of reaching out, going to the woods stay with their backpacks to, to save lives, which is, of course, really beautiful and uplifting. But on the other hand, it's also extremely unfair uh, because uh, this means that people's lives and economies, as I've said, have been put on hold and that, that, that as, a, as Poland, as a member of the European Union, we have services, uh, we have legal procedures, we have systems that uh, we could use to respond to this crisis and to, to help people trapped in the woods, but we're not doing this. Uh, and uh, all this kind of assistance 
rely rely on us and 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 the local population especially which have been hit particularly hard by the state of emergency because uh, it's not only about the fact that you know just overnight basically they woke up in a militarized zone full of tanks full of helicopters full of soldiers that are basically patrolling um, uh, patrolling their town, patrolling their villages, patrolling the forest, which has been, uh, which is a really, really important kind of site in Poland. That's a very important tourist place, but also their jobs, their economies um, have suffered um, um, uh, tremendously because because of this crisis. And as you can imagine, the the kind of the, the also the mental health, the the, the condition of, of living in this kind of militarized zone and and militarized situation. It's, it's really it's really difficult and if we have time maybe in the next round i can also maybe share with you some of the reports from the field you know from from the from the intent from what we're seeing and what we what, what what kind of you know interventions we have been undertaking just to just to bring it a little bit closer to you what we what we're dealing with Okay, yes, so you mean um, that the very specific activities. Um, um, maybe um, to turn to you, Kirill, again, um, I understand that your situation in Tukasha is very different, but um, I mean, your, um, your organization has been working for a while. Um, Except for uh, staying in contact with refugees, uh, have there been any activities that you could do? And maybe could you also explain, if you can, um, why you now liquidated and what has uh, happened that this work is has become so uh, difficult? Um, and maybe also, um, do you get any support? Do you get, is there any support by other organizations, by locals, society, um, who is there left to cooperate with on this issue at the border? Yeah, and thank you. So yes, first of all, uh, so we are liquidated uh, nowadays. And so as, uh, that's why uh, we sometimes call us as a team, not as an organization, because it's like uh, much more correctly. Yes, and so we are liquidated because of this uh, consequences of the summer or August 2020. So as far as I don't know, as far as you understand, but like there is no like NGO um, who is still existing in Belarus and who is like, uh, um, has the legal status so they can do um, made some activities from in the legal framework from the understanding of the Belarusian authorities yes and it's quite a lot limited our uh, our number of activities so we just uh, trying to provide the legal assistance to the refugees so um, we prepare some like um, legal material for them and trying to share this information we was trying to share yes this information through through the chats yes so we translate this information into the like uh english uh, arabic language french kurmanji and so on so uh trying to explain uh people the basic um, principle of the application for international procedure uh trying to explain them uh what how Mm, could they apply also in Belarus for international protection and how could they in general stay stay in Belarus for for this period and if they want to prolong the term of stay yes uh, so this is maybe the only one opportunity the real one for us is so to help them somehow online and only with a legal matter before because before we provide them a lot of humanitarian assistance cultural assistance so we got an office in the uh, breast in minsk and so on and so on yes and if you speak about cooperation yes we mostly cooperate 
sure with our Polish colleagues, yes, from the, for example, from that side, Selenia, uh, if you speak about some kind of uh, uh, common statements on the situation on the border, yes, and the, with the local Helsinki Foundation, if you speak about some legal support, so we, we will help them uh, with uh, some uh, cases connected to European Court of Human Rights, and kind others versus Poland, uh, and other like uh, interim measures on the border, so trying also connected with them to provide, once again, legal assistance to the refugees if they agree to so defense their rights through the existing like this European Court of Human Rights procedure. Yes, but nowadays it's also it's quite difficult uh, once again because of this status quo on the border and in Belarus in general. And I asked something or as a follow up question to that. Uh, I know that uh, the numbers of asylum in Belarus are extremely low. So what is the legal status of these refugees? And ha has that changed? Because as you mentioned, you've been working with other kinds of refugees, transit refugees, basically mainly from Russia before. Has there a change in their legal status since this crisis? So like number of applicants? Uh, the numbers, yes, and also if, if the regulation somehow changed or is it still the same for staying in Belarus and how is it? No, for the, for example, for the foreign citizens, like for, from the countries or for the citizens of country of origins of like Iraq, um, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, doesn't uh, change. Yes, but we should understand like uh, in, in more like in the very general like com common view that the procedure of the um, international protection, the common procedure doesn't exist like in Belarus, uh, doesn't work because, for example, if you go, we trying to understand the, for example, statistic uh, of the uh, applicants for the international protection in Belarus from like uh, Iraq citizen, yes, because we understand that mostly refugees who now they stay in Belarus, it's more Kurdish people, um, citizens of Iraq. So from 2004, up to 2020, there was 137 applications, and uh, only two of the applicants get a status in the Belarus. Yes, uh, la, our ministry do not like explain whether uh, the rejection was like um, has some reasons, background, and so on and so on. But this is like the statistics that show us that even instead of the uh, conflicts in Iraq, war in Iraq, so we do not uh, accept the refugees from the Iraq. Yes, uh, and uh, so once again, it shows and a lot of uh, other uh, examples when the and uh, a lot of uh, like uh, international organization like an um, amnesty also recognize that uh, and mentioned that uh, the the pr procedure of the application for international protection is Belarus. It's like, uh, like it's, it's not an uh, how to say ideal, and and the fact it doesn't exist. Well, I understand how important international organizations and also international community is for you. Um, one question would also be: Have you been aware of a debate? of Belarusian society since this summer? How is the atmosphere towards uh, refugees? Has there been a change? Could you observe something? Maybe this is one of the most interesting things that we could mention in this like situation, this crisis. Uh, what is the um, issue? So we, uh, all of us, like we realize that the um, Authorities, Belarusian is responsible for the creation of this crisis, yes, but the, um, the fact that the state media and also like the uh, our um, state bodies, um, they used one of the most like correct vocabulary um, in relation to the migrants, so they called them migrants, forced migrants, refugees, foreign citizens, and so on and so on. Uh, finally, so they um, organized the collection of the humanitarian aid uh, for the uh, refugees, and finally, so they also like um, gave them this logistic center also for allocation. Um, 
uh, so give them opportunity to stay in this center, yes? And if you speak about like our non-state uh, media, the media who supporting, I don't know, like the prote peaceful protesters, so on, like independent media, yes? They um, use the war, the most incorrect vocabulary to the migrants. They call them illegal, so illegal migrants, nelegale in Russian, yes? And some of them even um, compare them with an animals, if you speak, so about the those refugees who are living in the camp, yes, uh, they also focused a lot of, um, of attention on the things, so on, I don't know, on the refugees' phones, on the refugees' clothes, on the way how um, much money did they spend, but no of them um, uh, focused on the reasons why do they uh, decide to leave their countries and when they focused on the money issues they drawing from uh, this the conclusion that uh, this people are not refugees. So they compare the, if you got some money, it means that you can't have some problems like uh, in the country of origin. So I think that this is one of the most unpredictable consequences that uh, the guys who is responsible for the crisis, they're uh, much more hum like human beings in this context than the, uh, those side who is uh, usually, who support the Belarusian refugees, yes, uh, extremely, and uh, usually they're so like independent, liberal, and so on and so on. This is some very contradicted. Thank you. Yes, thank you for this insight. This has been very telling. Um, maybe Lydia, <laughs> To come back to you, um, I, I wanted to do in this discussion also um, to try um, to somehow locate a little bit um, where civilian actors, what do civilian actors mean for migration? Because we see now a border issue um, and we see, uh, especially on Polish side, um, organizations doing the work that you would expect maybe states to do. Um, could you give us more an insight of what does it mean that mm -hmm. um, yeah, organizations like these are doing this maybe states work or in lack of uh, regulations? Um, how would you evaluate this also based maybe on your research or mm -hmm. research in general? Uh, thank you. I think that um, your question is connected, in fact, with the consequences of, uh, of uh, the state of emergency, which uh, uh, Katarzyna has already uh, touched upon. Uh, this is the first, um, this type of legislation uh, in Poland since, uh, 40, uh, since 40 years, and now we have today, as we speak, uh, it is worth probably uh, adding with some reflection. Uh, it so happens that it is the round 40th anniversary of the introduction of the fateful martial law in Poland in 1981, when um, it was uh, also state of emergency and when over a million of refugees left Poland, on the other hand, in the direction also of Germany, Italy, Austria, and so on, and they were received in these places. But somehow these things uh, got forgotten. Uh, and I think that the primary purpose of, of the state of emergency uh, this summer was to uh, have civil rights restricted, the prerogatives of the uniformed forces increased, and, and just importantly, to hide all of this from, uh, from the public eye, to keep media out. But in fact, um, the consequences are, are much broader, of course, mostly for the consequences, these are the consequences for the refugees themselves, but also for uh, the humanitarians. So um, I think that um, at first, uh, this question um, of the, what does state of emergency do to, to the state itself and, and to people living in it? Um, because we think that um, with such a measure, a state shows its strength. And at first glance, um, this firm protection of the border gives the impression of state power. After all, the state decides who um, has access to its territory and thus uh, can claim rights and who doesn't. Uh, however, the idea of a barrier also contains very many weaknesses of the state. One of them lies in the, in the problem of uh, communication, for example. We can see that the Polish state cannot communicate with, uh, with its neighbor, right, with Belarus. This is, this is clear. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, there is uh, if, if probably you have already uh, 
realized that the only politicians who try to communicate with uh, uh, Belarusian president uh, are doing this ahead of, uh, let's say, uh, Polish politicians, because uh, this has been proved um, uh, completely um, 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 the way which doesn't, which simply doesn't work. For, but for the humanitarians, as as, as we say, um, Katarzyna said that uh, their organizations were not uh, meant for um, work with uh, the refugees uh, crisis, with the refugee crisis. And we can see that when the state uh, um, is is um, not present, when it fails to act. Uh, it gives um, um, uh, it's in fact it's part of of its power into into the hands of people who are not looking for this power, right? And um, but uh, but now um, uh, they have to step in uh, because to to um, uh, somehow elevate the, the human consequences of, of of this of this problem. And I think that it, it will be not a surprise that or any kind of rhetorical abuse to say that the role of the civil society in the current crisis on the border is absolutely crucial. Um, because the state has withdrawn from the protection of life at risk uh, or even contributes uh, to that risk and humani humanitarians have stepped in, uh, even though their room of action is, is so severely limited as, as Katarzyna said. And, but thanks to the activities of the NGOs, uh, we have uh, this, board, uh, this broader information, first of all. We learn about the scale and nature of the guard activities, the consequences of the pushbacks. We receive information in the form of conferences, reports on the situations, uh, some situation on the border, and one of them very extensive bilingual report from Grupa Granica, right? So, um, and of course, they, they are helping those who are uh, whose life is at risk, but um, the, the role of civil uh, society and humanitarian aid is seemingly such an um, uncontroversial topic, right, in the public sphere, uh, unlike in academic debates where, where humanitarian aid is subject to usual and also justified uh, critical scrutiny. But uh, my main point maybe here would be to say that, because we don't have time to speak about academic debates, that unlike humanitarian aid, which has been for decades carried out in the places from where refugees are coming today, um, um, help offered at the EU borders, including this border, is met with a lot of controversy and is highly politicized. And as some time ago, help given to um, um, to refugees like I don't know Vietnamese refugees from the 70s by the German activist Rupert Neudek, um, who got so many prizes, and he was um, seen only as a humanitarian because the period was different, the context was different. Today, in the politicized and polarized debate about migration, every measure is or is interpreted as a political act, and I'm sure Katarzyna can confirm that, um, that um, whatever is being done, it is seen as a political act. The majority of humanitarians, those um, who are working ad hoc and those associated in earlier structures, though, as Katarzyna said, in Poland, we are dealing mainly with organizations newly created for this very purpose, they will say that their aid, the aid they provide is not political, it's, it is a classic humanitarian function of saving lives. Uh, whereas they will say this, the other side uh, will see their actions as a genuinely political act. And this debate is, of course, not new. Um, it was recently present, among other, in the German, French, Italian media discussing the situation of refugees, uh, for example, um, in the Mediterranean, uh, where private organizations and individuals came to help um, of refugees in the boats. Uh, and they were also facing fines and arrests uh, for example, the Sea Watch uh, activists in the Mediterranean. And there is a lot uh, of beautiful, great research on the solidarity activism uh, at the borders. Um, and I'm sure that what is happening right now on the Eastern Polish border is already being also uh, researched uh, because uh, this is a huge and very interesting phenomenon. Um, and um, in the societies polarized over, over the issue of migration, civil society um, intervenes um, today at the border where the state, as I say, fails to act, causes harm. And therefore, um, 
I think that um, we, we need to have a lot of understanding for the, what they are doing because the state of emergency contributes to the increase of the professionalization of, of, of their help, which is, which is needed. Uh, uh, these people have to be very uh, well organized, very determined, as we heard from Katarzyna, with a strong support in order to be able to bring help against all the limitations. Uh, and uh, maybe the last thing I, I should say is that uh, uh, this professionalization that um, they're undergoing is inevitably, again, boosting politicization, even though this political framework of humanitarian aid, uh, especially under their circumstances of pushbacks, is anyway predefined. And these actions of volunteers and workers, their attempt to address migrants as dignified subjects and people whose lives is worth saving, turns unexpectedly their activity suddenly into a political act uh, in a large vol involuntary way. Uh, because these are the people who refuse to be, I would say after Michael Rodberg, who is an American uh, scholar, they refuse to be the implicated subject. Um, this is the term denoting the position of a passive onlooker to the violence and crime taking place before their eyes. So they choose to act uh, instead of being uh, implicated subject. Oh yes, thank you. So this made, I think, very clear why we've been having this panel today. And I know the time is running, um, but maybe I would like to ask to both our activists. I mean, I feel, I think we talked about this before, but um, what we can't, cannot do at the moment is giving a voice to refugees. Um, as they have not or are not in this panel, but um, so they cannot voice the, uh, raise their own voice. But um, I was wondering, um, maybe you could tell us um, one personal story you heard of, if you if you like, if you if you comfortable with um, to finish this discussion, or Kasia. Um, because you talked about specific activities of Grupa Granica, um, maybe you could mention one of them to um, remind us um, at the, the end of this discussion what we are talking about, actually. So um, maybe, Kasia, you could start. Yes, uh, thank you, Nadia. I, I, I don't want to, by any way, kind of claim to speak uh, for for migrants and to share their stories and I also want to acknowledge that we're missing them on this panel and that their you know their lack of presence is also a message uh, um, why they're not here and that we wish they were here uh, so maybe instead of sharing some of the stories we hear uh, their their personal stories um maybe what i can do is just write is just maybe read to you some excerpts from um the interventions uh the notes from 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 the intervention so how it usually looks like that when we receive a call for help we get to the woods trying to bring kind of humanitarian or uh, humanitarian and or legal assistance or try to assist people to get the medical assistance we usually you know go back and 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 kind of take a record of what has happened so maybe i'm just going to read a couple of excerpts excerpts from those notes just to just to bring the cl it closer to you what it means to to do solidarity activism as 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 lydia said in this context um, so these are some the excerpts from the notes from the interventions we have undertaken in November. Uh, one woman pregnant, two kids with autism, uh, one person uh, after the foot operation, everyone's very weak and they don't, don't have any more power to walk. <laughs> Eventually, we could not locate the group who, has, who have asked for our assistance. Different note, 20 pushbacks people, a group in the forest between the borders for 14 days. Uh, the person who was reported missing has been uh, taken from 
by the police from the detention center to the hospital, but we have not heard about him ever again. Two men, 22 years. One was pushed to the river by the border guards, was taken with the river. The other accept. They have been lost four days on the border. Their friend has died. Um, they have been attacked by the gas, uh, by the Belarusian police, uh, and they have been traveling with children. They reached to Warsaw, but they have been pushed back from Warsaw after they were caught in supermarket by the Polish police. The person has, um, um, has um, epilepsy. Uh, he has to take the dose of medicines every day, but he only has a dose for the next five days. The needs reported to us to stay alive. So these are these kind of stories that we unfortunately have to deal with um, every day uh, as we refuse the, to be this uh, implicated subjects and doing the solidarity activists to bring us up. Yes, thank you. I mean, Kiri, your contact is very different, but maybe is there one story you could tell us of um, that you would like to share? Or if it's uh, difficult, um, something you would like to uh, add on the stories you've been hearing on, of? Yeah, thank you. I just want to share my, maybe not like the mm, very deep story interview, but the thing that I was like, uh, um, how to say, I understand. Uh, I'm at that at that moment when I he hear the story, I understand the refugee very well because uh, it was a story of a uh, uh, young guy uh, who was participating in the some peaceful process. Protests and like during the clash, um, and um, because of the clash uh, during this uh, peaceful process, he was injured and he was asking for the, of course, med medical insurance and so on. But then he was persecuted because, like, authorities realized that he get this injury because of participating in the, this peaceful demonstration. And I understand that this situation was corresponded 100% to those uh, this situation with which faced like Belarusian uh, refugees, Belarusian activists in Belarus during 2020. And my my like my main message is that. Um, a lot of people focused uh, attention that this is like the concept of other. They are other uh, mm, pay, mm, pay attention about on the differences. But the, my idea is that we all are human beings. It is very sad, but we faced with the, uh, with the same difficulties, with the same problems, with the same persecution and so on and so on. And we trying to, for us, the solution is trying to understand these people uh, to like to wear their clothes, so and trying to help them in all like way that we can. Thank you. Thank you. 